the last couple of videos, I introduced web exploit kits like Black Hole, Cool, Nuclear, uh, Phoenix, and others. And I talked about how these kits work. And what I'd like to do in this video is delve specifically into what techniques these kits employ for trying to thwart detections. Okay? So for starters, uh, toolkits like, for example, Black Hole, leverage a technique known as uh, randomized uh, domains. And actually, specifically, it's randomized one-time domains, but I won't write all that out. Hopefully, you get the idea. And the idea behind randomized domains, let's say you have a victim, and let's just draw a victim out here. And let's say this victim happens to visit, or the victim's browser, rather, visits a, uh, a website uh, that somehow directs him to a server that hosts an exploit toolkit, like, let's say, Black Hole. Okay. What will happen is that the server and really the exploit kit will be designed so that each victim arrives at that server using a different fully qualified domain name. And specifically, this fully qualified domain name will be one that contains a random looking string. And, and that's actually not something that most victims would even notice. Uh, so for example, let me make this a bit more concrete. Uh, imagine the random looking string is, I don't know, F A one three two seven G uh, dot example.com, where example.com is the domain at which uh, the exploit kit is hosted. Okay, and each particular user is going to arrive at that exploit kit through a different domain. Okay, and typically randomization is done uh, when this technique is used, it's done at the subdomain level. So the subdomain uh, will be in fact randomized. All right, so the first time a victim visits this particular page, what's going to happen is the victim is going to then uh, receive on his system. A cookie okay and this is not the kind of cookie you can eat this is what's known as a web cookie and in fact a web cookie what it basically is you can think of it as a, a small file okay a small file that uh, will be dropped onto your system by a web server and it's typically used so that the web server can maintain state since HTTP or the, the hypertext transfer protocol which is the protocol over which web traffic goes uh, that's a stateless protocol and so cookies can be used, for example, to determine if a user has visited a site before. And I do want to point out that cookies in and of themselves, you know, they're not inherently malicious, but they are used everywhere and all over the place. Uh, in this particular case, the way that cookies are used is they're used to determine if the same user is coming back to the system versus a new user. Okay. So for example, let's say this particular victim here. Uh, goes and he visits the site and, and let's say he has uh, his browser is vulnerable or maybe one of his plugins is vulnerable. Uh, the site's going to place a cookie and, and for this particular user, any user that has this cookie that came from this domain, the web server will try to send exploit code back to the user and then try to compromise his browser and hopefully compromise the entire system the user is on. Okay. Now imagine for a moment that somebody else visited this page. Let's say that uh, there was another person over here and this person visited the same server and imagine for a moment that they also visited using the same the same subdomain and the same actual full domain itself. Okay. Uh, in this particular case what the server will notice is that hey this user this domain has been visited before and this particular user does not have the cookie. Okay, He doesn't have this particular cookie right here. And so the server will actually transfer back instead of transferring the attack code or some page that it would have normally transferred it's going to transmit a page that looks otherwise benign it's going to transmit a very normal looking page maybe even a page that says nothing's available okay so everything will seem like copacetic it'll look like this particular system has this particular server has no malicious code on it now i do want to take a step back and and Ponder, you know, why would it be that attackers would go to such lengths? Well, the benefit of this approach from an attacker's perspective is that if the original user reported the URL to his or her, let's say, uh, IT security department or maybe to a vendor in the malware protection space, then the IT security department, the vendor, etc., they would have a hard time investigating what happened since they wouldn't see the same thing as the actual victim saw. A vendor or a researcher would be would have the same view as this person, the view of somebody who doesn't have the cookie. And if you don't have the cookie, the server is going to respond back to you with something that does not look malicious. 
Okay, and in general, you know, exploit kit authors are especially wary of any traffic that's coming from a site or, or an IP address other than that of its intended victims. So, for example, in a bit of a you know perhaps strange or maybe ironic twist, a lot of exploit kits themselves employ IP blacklisting. Okay, and what they'll particularly do is they'll look for uh, people coming from IP addresses that, that are indicative of, of a non-traditional user. So, for example, maybe the, the IP associated with the, the Google bot, which is the uh, Google crawler that it uses to index the web. Um, in that particular case, the exploit kit is going to return back a different response to the Google bot. It will return a different response back to uh, anybody who it does not think is an actual victim, or at least it will try to do that. Okay. And you know, again, the, the idea is to make it difficult for security researchers to get any interesting information about the exploit kit. Okay. In fact, Black Hole uh, can actually do something further, and other exploit kits do this as well, is that uh, Black Hole, for example, can block traffic from what are called Tor exit nodes. Okay, Tor exit nodes. And, and what is a Tor exit node? Well, maybe I should first describe uh, what Tor is. Uh, Tor stands for the onion router. It's basically a routing protocol uh, in which, uh, and it really it's, it's a routing protocol that's designed to provide online anonymity and privacy. And so imagine if you have a source host, let's say a source system, and it wants to communicate with some, some destination, okay? And it wants to transmit traffic back and forth. All right? Now, in the Tor protocol, what's going to happen is, is the traffic from the source to the destination is going to be routed through one or more Tor nodes, okay? And these Tor nodes are basically going to serve the purpose of essentially encrypting and decrypting traffic in such a manner that it becomes really intractable, really difficult to identify the original source. So now this particular system here, the destination system, is going to have a hard time. It's not going to be able to know who, this, who the originator of the traffic was, okay? The Tor network is going to basically anonymize that that data in between, okay? And typically, the last Tor server, the last intermediary server here, uh, is actually known as a Tor exit node, okay? Now, Tor is a useful mechanism if you are trying to maintain privacy or, let's say, surf the web anonymously. And since security researchers might themselves be trying to navigate black hole infected sites or sites infected using any exploit toolkit, using a service like Tor to kind of hide their own tracks, the authors of Black Hole, the authors of other exploit kits might understandably be very wary of traffic coming from known Tor exit nodes. And so they offer the option, in many cases, of blocking any traffic that came from a Tor exit node. Okay? And that again is designed to prevent researchers from being able to analyze these particular toolkits. Okay? Now on a similar note, a lot of these toolkits, uh, for example, toolkits like Black Hole, also use techniques like obfuscation of their web pages. Uh, so when you see a PHP script from Black Hole, uh, you won't see the original version. You'll see something that's been heavily obfuscated. And Black Hole in particular actually uses a publicly available tool uh, known as IonCube. Okay, IonCube, uh, which is a obfuscator okay, to perform this type of obfuscation. And again, I want to point out here that obfuscation in general or obfuscation tools, you know, they're not inherently malicious. Website designers might legitimately want to employ these types of tools to make it harder for someone to copy or pirate their web pages. All right? But the presence of obfuscation techniques just makes analysis that much harder. Okay? And then finally, one more technique I want to mention is that uh, oftentimes the management console, and keep in mind that the management console is how the person who deploys the toolkit actually gets, gets stats uh, regarding what happens. Uh, in terms of infection and so on. The, the management console itself is password protected. And that's something you, you would typically expect. Obviously, the attacker uh, doesn't want anybody else to uh, be able to access his or her server or access his or her data. And so the management console will, in fact, be password protected. What's also interesting is that some toolkits, and Black Hole is an example of this, employ what's known as a CAPTCHA. Okay, a CAPTCHA basically, and you've probably seen CAPTCHAs before, uh, CAPTCHAs are, you know, when you see websites that require you to 
actually display some type of an image, including numbers and letters that are stretched and muddled and scaled in some way, and then they ask you to type those letters in to see if, if you can prove that you're a human. Okay, um, that's what a captcha is, and and the reason for using a captcha to protect a web attack toolkit is that uh, in this particular case, uh, if any malicious party, and this is maybe a malicious party attacking another malicious party, but if any malicious party is trying to brute force the management password on the toolkit's management console, and that toolkit has a captcha in place, it's really hard to brute force such an attack because that would require that the attacker solve all these captures along the way. All right, and that's going to make the attack more or less impractical. So this is just a smattering of techniques that web exploit kits use to make themselves harder to detect. And hopefully you found this video and the others I've done on this topic somewhat useful.